Cool, at this point, let's actually go and create our own key. So we're gonna go into this build file over here and we're going to actually, no, don't show this again. Uh, we don't need to re-import. We're not gonna do anything with metals today. It's just, you know, just this, okay? So uh, what we're gonna do is we're just gonna paste this and we're going to remove that and I'm gonna create a line over here. So this one is going to be our setting key, okay? And this is going to be the setting key and its value is going to be simply a string. Don't confuse it with this string. This string is just a description, okay? So we're going to do this and we're gonna say that this is going to be our setting key and we don't need the rest of the line, okay? So we're also gonna have a task over here and we're going to have a task over here and we're gonna go and have a task over here, okay? So now we have these two keys and metals doesn't bother us anymore. In fact, we should probably do this and we should go to the terminal and we should run SBT over here. All right, this is a common Vim mistake. I have a K over here, task key, and we're gonna do R so that it reloads and everything should be fine, okay? So now if you were to try to, you know, see our keys, SBT will actually bark at us because this is this difference, you know, where this is just a key, it's not even on the graph, you know, we don't even have the setting yet. Neither we have it nor do we use it, okay? So if we do something like our setting key, it will tell us that it's actually, you know, not defined anywhere, it's just a key, just like part of a legend somewhere. So let's go and define it. So we're gonna go over here, we're gonna do dot settings. All right, we're gonna do this. And over here, we're simply going to say that this is going to be our setting key, colon equals, okay? And over here, we're going to say print line, we're gonna do a Scala, whoops, not what I wanted, Scala dot console dot yellow, we're gonna do plus Java time local time dot now, plus Scala, Scala dot console, dot reset like this okay and we're simply whoa that's not what i wanted reset like this and what i want to return is that this is our going to be our setting value like this so i'm going to copy this this whole thing go over here comma paste and this is going to be our task key and over here we're going to use a different color so we're going to do something like magenta and over here we're going to say task Okay, like this. Okay, and now if we go down over here, we could do something like our setting key, and now we're going to see our setting key. I already know what happened. Every time I type in our, I do our out. Okay, that's not what happened. Okay, another K. There we go. Task. There we go. All right. So, not what I want. Not what I wanted. I want to go over here, and I want to do R. There we go. Okay, so when the build loads, we should see our setting. We should see our setting in yellow over here, right? So this came from over here. And if you want to see our value, right? Our setting, setting, our setting, setting, our setting key, we're going to see our setting value. And if we do our task key, we're not going to see anything, right? But we're going to see the time, right? Every time, every time it evaluates, right? Our setting key, right? It's already evaluated. It's like, it's like a val, okay? So over here, if we wanted to actually see the value, we would need to do show, show our task key. There we go. But every time we have a different timestamp because it's like a def. So before we simply had the keys, right? Which was sort of like the legend of the graph. Now we actually have the defined settings or tasks, which are the nodes of the graph. And now it's time to define the edges. And we define the edges by simply depending on other tasks. And as we have seen before, all we need is to use the dot value macro. It's actually a macro. We're going to talk about this in just a sec. Okay, so let's say that we want to have this setting depend on this task. So all we need to do is we need to use its value. So for example, over here, we would simply do uh, depends on and we're going to do plus and now we're going to say our task key dot value. That value is very important. Please do not forget this. Okay, so now if we simply reload the build, we should see that the settings, you know, that is loaded. Oh yeah, sorry, I looked at the wrong place in my script. This is actually something that I wanted to show you later. A setting cannot depend on the task. So what I actually wanted to have was something like this. Okay, so there's our task value that depends on setting key like this, and we're gonna go here and do this. Okay, so this is actually what I wanted. So if we do something like our setting key, it's already evaluated at build time, right? Somewhere at the top, we see the yellow timestamp. However, if we do our task key, then we're going to see that, well, we need to actually show it, right? We need to go and show it, okay? Our task value depends on our setting value, right? Our setting value over there. And if we also inspect, inspect our task key 
like this, we will see over here, first of all, we see the description, we see that it's a task that returns a string, we see where, where it is actually provided, where it is actually defined, you know, at build line 21, which is over here, or task key, we see that it depends on our setting key, okay? Which means that if we inspect tree, we should actually see this, right? As a tree, you see that it has a dependency on our setting key and you even see the value. So a task can depend on a setting, a setting cannot depend on a task. However, a task can obviously depend on a task and a setting can obviously depend on the setting. Let's go and demonstrate that. For example, over here, we're going to say depends on and we're going to say plus over here and we're going to grab something in random like source directory dot value dot to string okay because source directory is actually a setting okay and over here we're going to go and use scala c options to your surprise and to mine as well scala c options is actually not a setting it is actually a task okay so i'm typing something completely random over here just to make it pretty you know so we're going to do make string and we're going to do like this like that okay there we go Okay, so uh, now if we go and if we show, let's let's do, let me do show our setting key. Let's wait for SBT to reload. This is completely normal, right? So SBT warns us that we define the setting that nobody's using. Okay, but let's actually sh see its value. And there we go. Our setting value depends on source directory dot value to string, right? So this worked because if we inspect source directory, we're going to see that it's a setting. Right, it's a setting which returns a file. Okay, and if we inspect Scala C options, we're going to see that it is actually a task over here. It's a task, which is why it's fine to do this. Right, so our task can have a dependency on another task, and as you can see over here, we're seeing the first three Scala C options. Weirdly enough, you can actually have a setting that has a dependency on another setting which is actually not another setting but itself. However, for this, you cannot use colon equals. You need to use plus equals instead. But first, let's try. So we're gonna go over here and we're gonna say our setting key dot value and SBT should bark at us, right? So if we just do something that will cause SBT to reload, we'll see that reference to an undefined setting, okay? However, we can go and we can do, let's go over here, for example, remove this and we can go over here and we can do some like our setting key right because now it has a value we can do something like plus equals and we can do space plus more stuff one okay and we can do this again and go to one and replace with two like this okay so now if we want to reload and we want to see our setting key right by the way auto completion works this is actually something that i uh, I forgot to show you before. For example, let's say you're looking for uh, compile slash console, right? So you would do C and you would press tab and you actually see all of this stuff, right? Console configuration and stuff. Okay, so you can uh, use either metals or you can use other completion uh, over here. Just don't, don't use the spaces. Okay, so if you do compile, um, if you do compile, you know, space and then space C, if you press tab. Oh, actually it works. Before it didn't actually work for me. Cool. By the way, it's Emacs key bindings, right? So if I have this and then press control U, it actually removes the entire line. Okay, now this thing is actually kind of a bit weird, right? Like changing this, it sort of like feels mutable and it actually doesn't really fit into this whole graph model. And in fact, it's kind of buggy. So if I take this, for example, if I put it over here, then we're actually not gonna see part of it. Okay, so if we do uh, show our setting key, okay, then we're actually not gonna see this because this was kind of like, sort of like specified before. It's, it's actually very, very, uh, weird as you can see our setting value plus more stuff too and before when it was down right over here we actually saw uh, saw both of them okay it's kind of a bit weird but in practice it, it actually very very rarely happens that you have some code like this now if your setting is of type sequence then you also have plus plus equals and also you have things like uh, minus equals or minus minus equals right so this is how for example the uh, library dependencies are done in fact I have examples of this somewhere over here um, so for example over here i'm no oh, bad example i don't have this but for example over here library dependencies we have plus plus equals sequence right this is where it comes from right because the type is simply simply a sequence now this dot value thing it is actually a macro over here right so every time you say dot value what is happening behind the scenes is actually something very very weird something will look at this it will take it out of this entire scope it would put it at the top it would make sure that it runs before this task key runs right so this is one of the benefits that you get from a grab but it's something that you need to be aware of that uh, you don't have a concept of timing you just have the concept of causality in order to demonstrate this we're actually going to go to the top and we're going to define a couple of more tasks okay so this one is going to be 
3 and this one is going to be 2 okay so we're going to go to y and we're going to add a 3 over here and over here we're going to add a 2 okay so now we're going to scroll down where we have our task key and we're going to uh, define our task key too so we're going to go and do this and uh, so this is going to be 2 and for 2 we're going to use rad over here okay and simply over here we're going to say that this is going to be our task value two okay so the second task has the rat color we're gonna go and copy this and we're gonna go paste over here so for the third one we're gonna use sign and we're gonna say that this is going to be our value three and we're actually gonna uh, delete it and we're going to paste it underneath okay so we're gonna have two and then some middle thing and then we have three okay and in the middle thing what we're gonna do is we're gonna say our task key dot value plus some space okay plus our task key Two dot value like this in fact in my example i actually have this one over here and this one over here right so like this so if we didn't know this fact about this whole parallelism and this whole causality thing and this whole graph thing then when we when would run the task three it would look like the first task would be evaluated first and the second task would be evaluated second which means we should see magenta first and then we should see rad okay and sometimes we will but sometimes we won't let's actually go and give it a try now there's some sort of um not really caching but um there's some sort of order how this whole file is parsed right and then this whole thing is being um placed into into some sort of list so as soon as sbt loads every time we're going to play around with this it is going to yield exactly the same results and then we're going to reload sbt and maybe we'll get sort of lucky so that I can show this to you that the order is going to be different and we're going to get there all right so we need to see the third one okay and we expect well sometimes we expect uh, to see um, magenta and then rad maybe it will happen like this so we see magenta and then rad and if we run it again a couple of times we're still going to see magenta and rad however if we reload at some point we'll actually see rad first oh, i'm sorry that's not what i wanted we'll actually see rad first and then magenta there you go right because it's executed in parallel however per build it seems to have some sort of order sbt has a couple of tricks to enforce sequentiality if that's even a word and this is how you do it okay so instead of this thing over here what you do is you use a fancy thing called def task dynamic like this okay and so you're going to define a task sort of on the fly and then by the end you're simply going to get its value okay so inside of it we're going to have magenta right which is going to be our task key that value because this is what we wanted to have uh first right this this thing okay so this is going to be magenta and inside of it we're going to use another thing called daf a regular task okay like this okay so this is a dynamic task that returns a task and then we're doing dot value on the task okay so inside of it we're going to have rad which is going to be our task key two dot value and somehow this thing is going to be executed later okay and now we can actually do magenta result plus you know our space you know plus rad like this okay so instead of this thing which runs in parallel uh we're going to have this thing which runs in sequence and there are also a couple of other ways to enforce sequentiality in sbt there is an entire section in the docs please check it out okay so let's go and take it for a spin we're going to do this so we see magenta and then rad a couple of times i'm going to reload magenta rad magenta rad reload magenta rad magenta rad reload magenta rad magenta rad I don't know if it's actually guaranteed or if there's some sort of like semi sequentiality, but it seems like it works. You know, we already tried it three times. All right, now the only thing that is left to discuss is the fallback strategy. Now, there is this sort of category of complexity that is always associated with hierarchies, whether it's cascading style sheets or whether it's object oriented hierarchies or whether it's something like implicit resolution rules or in our case, the tasks and settings fallback or delegation rules that said they're usually relatively well documented so please rtfm in fact right now what we're going to do is i already have it prepared over here we're going to go and open it so in sbt docs there is this scope delegation rules a very dedicated section and there are only five rules so we're going to have a look at them one by one 
First, we're going to start with these middle rules, two, three, and four, because they're kind of similar, right? The second rule is for projects, the third rule is for configurations, and the fourth rule is for the tasks, right? So one rule per scope, okay? And over here, it just says that given a scope, delegate scopes are searched by substituting the task axis in the following order, the given task scoping, and then zero, which is non-task scope version of the scope. Essentially, what this means that if, for example, you're looking for project A slash compile slash console slash Scala C options, however, it's not defined, it will simply start falling back. And if it finds the one that does not have a task uh, scope specified, right, the console, right? So if it finds project A slash compile slash Scala C options, then it will take that, right? So you basically inject the zero in the task axis, and zero is a special scope, which is sort of like none. The third rule is exactly the same one for configurations. However, there's a tiny caveat because configurations can have dependencies between them. We also look into the parent first before falling back all the way down to zero, right? So for example, as a reminder, the test scope de depends on the compile scope. So if you're looking for something in the test scope, it is not there, but it is in the compile scope, you're very likely to find it. However, as we have seen before, if we also specify the task axis, then it's a totally different game. The fourth rule is exactly the same rule, but for projects, right? So if it's missing, it will be substituted with zero. However, there is also a tiny caveat. There is a special thing called this build, and it is done in such a way that you can specify settings for all kinds of projects. And also, have you ever wondered if you do something like this build high from you know my thingy, and then it actually doesn't apply? Well, it doesn't apply because it's actually not like the first thing that has the priority. It's actually very, very low, very, very uh, uh, much down. Uh, in terms of the fallback strategy, right? So if, if there is a more specific key, yours simply is not going to be found. All right, so to recap, the rules two, three, four, they're simply like the fallback ones for either the task back to zero or the configuration back to zero, but also through the dependencies or the project back to zero, but also let's look into this build. And by the way, global is also a very special scope. It's, well, actually it's not that special. It is simply a syntactic sugar for zero, 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 right? So all the tasks, uh, I'm sorry, all the scopes set to zero. This is what global slash, uh, what was that thing that we're actually using um, over here? Um, over here at the very top, right? This thing is exactly the same thing as saying zero project, zero configuration, you know, uh, zero, uh, zero task, right? So it's exactly the same thing, which is why if we do something like show, it will, you know, it will reload. If we do show, um, well, I need, I need some sort of change like this, okay? Show, as you can see, it still works. It works exactly the same. It was just a, just a, um, just a shortcut, okay? Let's go back over here, okay? So these were these three rules, two, three, and four. And they're kind of simple, they run in parallel, and once they found what they were looking for, they kind of exit early. The first rule is simply the rule that explains how to join them, right? And it's very, very simple. It's left to right, you know, first the project has a priority, then the configuration, and then the task. All right, now let's take a look at the rule number five, which is the most complicated rule. A delegated scoped key and its dependent settings or tasks are evaluated without carrying the original context. Now, what this means is that if you do this build slash, it can actually not see the stuff from your projects. This is in contrast to the classic object-oriented hierarchy where a superclass can actually see the implementations of the protected methods, for example, okay? Over here, it's sort of like in reverse, which is why this build slash only have like very very simple things like the organization or the name not something that depends on something project specific this is also why if we open this which is which is why uh, all the sbt builds uh the one that you see in the wild which is why they always have something like uh common settings right because if this was not required you could always just say this build slash and then just do stuff right uh however for example um I have a file called uh, Scala C. It is actually a Scala file, okay? And then over here I do, where do I do this? Maybe I don't do this over there. Uh, Scala C options. Where do I do this? Hold on, Scala C, uh, Scala C options. Uh, not this. Here, there we go, okay. So I have a Scala C.sbt, and over there I do this build slash Scala C options, right? And I specify a bunch of them. However, this is not enough because over here I have the common Scala C options. And over here, I need to be very, very specific. I need to say for this project, for compile, for console, I need to have this Scala C options. This build cannot see this, right? It cannot see this like this protective DAF of the uh, classes that like, 
e extend itself, okay? Which is why you have this common scala C options and then you sort of like mix it in into all of your other builds. Since this is actually the most complicated one, I'm actually gonna give you some homework. First of all, read through this page because it actually has uh, exercises over here with the solutions. Don't jump to the solutions too quickly, okay? So for example, over here, rule one, rule two, you see it has an exercise and it also has a solution. Okay, exercise, question, solution. Don't look at the solutions, okay? And then once you're done, what you need to do is you need to go in, you need to use my template, right? So we're gonna go over here, right? So if you don't have Jitterate installed, just do SBT new, dev inside your slash Scala seed or Scala 3 seed, it doesn't really matter. Because we're using SBT, we actually need to do dot G8. You create an empty project, and uh, I'm gonna wait a little bit for SBT to finish. And by the way, uh, since, I don't know, I believe in like a couple of versions ago in SBT, when you use Jitterate uh, from SBT, SBT used to leave the target directory behind. These days it doesn't do this anymore. I feel like SBT kind of got stuck. It should not need so much time. Let's do this again. No idea what's currently happening. Let's just use this, right? It should be much faster anyway. I us usually use Jitterate instead of SBT. Okay, so we're gonna do playground, playground two. Oh, we already have Playground 2. Okay, damn it. Let's do this again. So we're going to do Playground 3. Playground 3. Okay, there we go. So we open this like this, Playground 3. Then you go over here, you open the build, build.spt. Okay, so what you do is you create a separate project. Okay, so we don't actually need metals. Okay, you just copy this, all right? Copy this, and you paste it over here, right? And we go... Uh, not what I wanted. Okay, so uh, we're gonna do something like uh, well, other project, right? Like this doesn't doesn't really matter. Okay, so we're gonna do uh, other hyphen project, uh, other hyphen project, like this. Okay, so now you have a build with two projects. Okay, so if we start SBT, and it will take a couple of seconds to load. Okay, what it will do is it will display something that is specified over here in aliases. Okay, in aliases, uh, by the way, notice this import util because you're going to need this for, for your task. Okay, over here, we're doing onload message plus equals and a bunch of stuff over here, right? Which means that when this BT finally finishes loading, it will display this beautiful, uh, beautiful ASCII art. And it will also be redisplayed every time you switch into this project. Okay, so if you do projects, right, or I have aliases, you know, I have L or LL, okay, you see that there are two projects, okay? And every time we switch into this project, which you can do by either typing root or by typing project, uh, you know, playground. Three, right? So every time you go in there, you see this message. However, if you go into the other one, right? So if you go into other project, okay? Then you're not going to see this, okay? And so your job is to make sure that, like this, your job is to make sure that every time you actually switch into any project, it should redisplay this ASCII thing. In fact, you won't need actually to do much. You will simply need to move it, right? So as a reminder, this is the exercise for understanding this whole this build slash thing. If you already know what you're doing, it should take you only 10 seconds. But if not, it should take you like five or 10 minutes to figure this out. Very, very important. Make sure that this line over here does not disappear, okay? The same way if you go back to root, it also has this, this one line. It should not disappear when you when you finish your task. All right, we're almost done with this video. I just have a couple of leftovers to mention. First and foremost, why is SBT so complicated and why do we need this complicated graph, you know, this DAG, this directed acyclic, acyclic graph model? SBT is complicated because the domain of build tools is very complicated. It needs to be able to accommodate for some extremely advanced, crazy scenarios. And this whole graph and scoping model allows you to inject your settings into completely arbitrary phases of your build. This is extremely powerful, however, in most cases, unnecessary. The graph model ensures that all of your tasks are executed only once and in parallel. This is extremely powerful. This is something that you want. In fact, this graph model is probably the only model that makes sense for build tools. However, I do agree that the way it is implemented in SBT could use even more improvement, even though SBT improved substantially over the last couple of years. It's really amazing these days. One of the things that I really wish that we would move away from were these configurations. Even though I myself defined my own configurations in the past, I had configurations 
configurations for all kinds of tasks, right? So I had unit tasks, I had integration tasks, and I had the acceptance tasks. And by the way, I actually wanted to show you how you can list all the configurations. I actually stole it from Stack Overflow from somebody, and I don't really know uh, whether this is something that is built in into SBT, but you can actually define your own task. So uh, we're going to go and I'm actually going to copy it from my script. Let me paste it over here like this. Okay, so this is going to be a task key, show configurations, and we're going to uh, grab it actually. So I'm going to go over here, I'm going to do settings and paste it over here. Show configurations is simply a task that returns a unit. So we're going to use the configuration key, we're going to say, uh, show, give us the old. So we're creating this filter uh, in any project and in any configuration, we're getting the value. Uh, we're doing distinct, we're doing sort by. Uh, this is a list of the, the dependency configurations, right? So for example, uh, task depends on console, right? So we're grouping them by size and by name. It's a tuple, right? And then we're simply printing them out, right? So this is just a fancy print line if it actually has um, uh, has extends configs or not, okay? So if we just do show configurations, then it should reload the build and actually show the configurations. There we go. So we have compile optional provided and Scala fix. We also have IT, which stands for integration test, and it extends runtime. Runtime extends compile. And we also have one parallel to IT, which is test that uh, extends runtime. And as I already mentioned, you can actually define your own. As you can see, for example, I have a Scala fix plugin, and it defined its own configuration. Also, for example, when I defined my own, I had my own integration tests, and I made sure that my integration test actually had a dependency on the other integration tests, which is why I could see, you know, uh, I could see the, the source code and I could also, um, I believe I could actually inherit the settings, but I'm not sure about this anymore. The second thing that I want to mention is for plugin authors. If you intend to write your plugins, you'll probably add your own keys. This is what most plugins do. And the way you should scope them is as follows. You want it to be as flexible for your users as possible. So what you do is you define the default for your key. This is something that you always should do when you define a plugin. And you make sure that it's at the very bottom of this fallback hierarchy, which is global, right? So let's say you create a key called foo, then the default value should be global slash foo. However, when you use your key, right? This is why you created the key, right? So, so that you use it in, in, in this plugin, then uh, make sure that you scope it as exact as possible. For example, let's say that you have written a plugin for the console uh, scope, right? Then you would specify it as, I don't know, my project slash, let's say compile slash console slash Ooh, right. So if you do this, your users will have the flexibility to override this key like anywhere in this in, in this entire delegation hierarchy. Right. So you have the default, which is very very bottom, and you're specif you're requesting something very very exact. If it's not there, it's going to fall back to something like compile slash uh, console, and then it's going to fall back to compile slash, and then it's going to uh, fall back to this build slash and only then if all of this fails uh, it will actually go and find your default which is global slash foo all right i hope that this video helped you to understand sbt and i see you in the next one for now as always it's been vlad from devinsidey.com don't forget to like this video if you did subscribe if you want to improve the developer inside you and if you learned something today consider supporting me on github sponsors or patreon whatever you prefer and let's watch my videos weeks and sometimes even months before everyone else and most importantly take care